Back in 1862, during the American Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln and his administration thought it necessary to have a garrison of Union troops stationed out here in the territory of Utah. The garrison's main purpose was to watch over and protect the mail routes, the overland mail routes between the eastern U.S. and the state of California. They had a secondary purpose, however, which was to watch over the Mormons, whose loyalties were not 100% trusted by the Union at the time. The federal troops arrived here in Utah in the fall of 1862, and by the early winter of 1863, it became necessary to establish a cemetery. The reason was not because somebody had died of illness or natural causes, but rather the troops had engaged the Shoshone on the Bear River in Idaho. This monument memorializes that engagement. At the time, the soldiers called it the Battle of Bear River, but today we recognize it as nothing less than a massacre where hundreds of Shoshone men, women, and children were killed. Now it was Colonel Patrick Connor who presided over the massacre, and he's buried here in the cemetery as well. This is the plot of Patrick Connor and some of his family. Patrick Connor was born in Ireland, in Kerry, Ireland, on March 17, 1820 which is probably why he got the name Patrick. But he immigrated to the United States about the age of 12 or 16, it's not totally clear. Uh, he served in the army a couple times and was a combat veteran of the Mexican-American War. After that, he went to California and when the Civil War kicked off, he volunteered and was assigned to come to Utah to protect the mail routes and to keep an eye on the Mormons. Colonel Connor was not a friend to the Mormons or the Native Americans. He killed the Native Americans whenever he thought he had the legal opportunity, and he sought to subvert Mormon social and political power in Utah by opening up areas for mining, hoping to attract non-Mormon miners and business interests to the territory. Colonel Connor described the events of the Bear River Massacre in such a way that he was promoted for the event. He also participated in other so-called battles that won him glory. Another notable figure here in the cemetery is James Duane Dottie, a former governor of the territory of Utah. James Dottie is remembered more in Madison, Wisconsin than he is here in Utah. And this is his grave. James Dottie was born in New York and in the 18 teens, he went to the Michigan Territory where he practiced law and became involved with local politics. He later got involved with more national politics and helped create the Territory of Wisconsin, hoping to become its first governor. He was frustrated in that attempt and became a land speculator. He bought a bunch of land and started to survey it and plot it out in preparation for a city, a city that became Madison, Wisconsin. Some of the men buried here in the cemetery belong to the 24th Infantry Regiment, which in the latter part of the 1800s was a black infantry regiment. They are more commonly known as Buffalo Soldiers who participated in various Indian Wars out here in the West. Some of these men later participated in the Spanish-American War, saw combat, and were even veterans of the most famous battle from that war, the Battle of San Juan Hill in Cuba. It's not just Americans who are buried here in the cemetery. There's also Germans and Italians and at least one Japanese from World War II. And they're buried here in this corner. When the U.S. entered World War I, 
Fort Douglas became a prisoner of war camp for some Germans. A lot of these were German sailors. With disease, accidents, you know, and the Spanish flu, many of them ended up dying. And so this monument here is to remember them. This monument was built in about 1933 and was restored in 1988. The Germans, the Italians, and presumably the Japanese who are buried in the cemetery are buried here in the southeast corner. There's quite a few, and one thing you'll notice here is they all have similar dates of death. Over here we have Friedrich Ritter, July 13th, 1945. While over here we have Ernst Fuchs, German, July 8th, 1945. Here's Walter Vogel, July 8th, 1945. Now it's not just coincidental that these Germans share the same death date. On July 8th, 1945, while they were asleep in their tents at a prisoner of war camp here in Utah, a guardsman on a tower opened fire with a machine gun and just shot into the tents. He killed, I think, nine people and wounded over a dozen others. There is, however, one grave that has until recently caused a lot of controversy in the cemetery, and that's the grave of Paul Eilert, who died on June 8, 1944, only two days after D-Day. One thing you'll notice about Paul's headstone here is that it's fairly new, and indeed, it is new. It's only about two years old. Up until 2022, his grave was a lot bigger. You can kind of see by the uh, darker grass here. His grave had a German uh, Knight's Cross on it, the Ritterkreuz, with a swastika. And why that was here was his fellow prisoners of war purchased the stone for something like $275 back in 1944-45, and they had it engraved with a swastika. And that headstone stayed here up until 2022, when it was removed and replaced with this standard issue military headstone. This cemetery is really unique amongst military cemeteries, and I've been to some here in the United States and in Europe as well. What makes this unique is how small it is and how broad the cross-section of history, of military history, this cemetery contains, all the way from the Civil War and the settlement of the American West through to the Gulf War. So, a lot of interesting histories that this cemetery points to. If you've got a chance, come check it out. Uh, this cemetery is not the only remaining part of Fort Douglas. A lot of the fort has been absorbed into the University of Utah, and some semi-original buildings remain just to the north of here. There's also the Fort Douglas Museum to check out as well. So with that said, I'd like to thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.